in your behavior. Repentance, mankind's part, followed by mercy and grace, God's part, working together with God, that's synergy. Then you're redeemed and reconciled. If the washing and regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit can take place. Then a person is truly redeemed. They're not in a state of sin confess, sin confess, still falling into those sins all the time. The reason those people keep falling into them under these, they get converted under this mess, this mixture of error under all these ministries out here, is because they've never come through this time of godly sorrow. They've never come clean with God in repentance. So it's our choice that we continually place our faith and our fidelity in Christ, because faith is faithfulness, empowered by that grace, Titus 2.11, that we can remain then in communion with God and endure to the end. Like Matthew 10.22 said, he that endures to the end will be saved. Or by patient continuance in doing good, we receive glory and honor and immortality. In Romans 2, 2, 7. If you're disobedient and you do not obey the truth, you receive indignation and wrath. See, salvation can only occur if man does his part, working together with God in repentance, and God will only grant remission or mercy on condition of that living sacrifice presented to him as the reasonable service as our duty as a bond servant to him. Isn't that what it says to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service? Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transform is metamorphosis there. It's what took place on the transfiguration of Christ. The renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable will and perfect will of God. That's how it works. Then you can enter into a relationship with God that you're not constantly falling into these sins all the time. Because those sins, regardless what these preachers are saying about the next two verses, of such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, and justified, and all things are lawful to me. Paul's not giving you a license to commit these sins when he already said, not only here, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, but in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, and Ephesians chapter 5, and Colossians chapter 3, that if you do them things, you won't inherit the kingdom. So you've got to understand them how many times they say that, that it's a sin to stop sinning and put forth any effort. Like that one preacher, a voice over someone's message I heard, somebody sent me the link, and as every time the person would say, you've got to turn from your sin, you've got to produce deeds worthy of repentance, this guy would say, I can't, I can't. Well, you mean you won't. That's what I posted back to him. Not you can't, you won't. See, like these street preachers say, well, man's not willing to turn from his... Well, why go out and even preach to him then if he's not willing? Well, God will make him willing. Where does it say God's going to make you willing? Where does it say that in, in John the Baptist's message? Where does it say that in any of the prophets, like uh, Isaiah chapter 1? Where does it say? It says, he says, come, let us reason together, says, says the Lord. Said, you wash your hands, you clean up, you go through that self cleansing humility, you cease to do evil and learn to do good, you seek justice and righteousness. Then come and reason with him for a reconciliation of those past sins committed. See, that's the problem with mixing truth with error, and that's why it matters. See, remember, the gift of God is His mercy for remission of past sins in His grace, which is a spiritual empowerment to live a godly life. See, God grants this mercy in this remission and empowerment as a result or in exchange for our sacrificial gift of this self-cleansing humility and broken heart towards God. So that's the process here that takes place. It's humility, confession, repentance, and obedience. Results in that clearing of wrongdoing and that vivant desire change, godly, godly zeal, fear, and self-vindication. The self-vindication would be making reconciliation where it's necessary. That's what the gift is about. So don't let them throw you for a loop every time they say, well, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is a gift of God. Yeah, the gift of God, of course, is remission of the past sins, the blood that only the blood 
sprinkled upon that heart to purge the conscience from dead works to serve the living God, like Hebrews 9.14, can remit that past sins. You're yet under your sin. Even if you stop sinning, like many people do, like I pointed out, they don't know anything about God. They don't love God. They don't love their neighbor or themselves. They don't serve Him. They don't worship Him. But they stop their vile addictions because it's ruinous to their lives. But their sins aren't remitted. They're past sin. So they may live a beneficial life in society. It's certainly better. Sin is insanity. It's madness to live that way and ruin your life and the lives of everybody around you. That's why God wants call, calling you out of sin, not to take all your fun and games away from you, but because it's ruinous to the world. Like, what's James chapter 4 when he starts out and he says, where do the wars and the fights and all that come from? It comes from you and your covetousness and your lust, and you have and you want and you can't get it. So you create all this chaos in your life and the lives of others to try to attain those things and find fulfillment in your drugs and your sex and your alcohol and all the rest of it. But yet it just brings you to ruin. See, God doing everything that He can to bring you out of self, into salvation, calling you, stretching forth His hand, not willing any should perish, calling you to reason together with Him, See, he's continually doing these things. See, God's outstretched hand is waiting for man to diligently seek him in repentance and faith proven by deeds. But it's man's part to take that step because God's already done everything he can do. Everything. And he's doing it 24-7. He's already done it in Christ and he's been doing all throughout history in man, but the church has been telling people they can't do anything, and he's got to do it for them. And then we come along and we leave the church, we leave the system, but yet we still preach this, some of you out there still preach this message laced with all this error. So you see what all I'm saying? It does matter who you support, who you post on your blogs. What kind of stuff you link yourself to on your websites? The type of theology that you promote that's all mixed up with all this reformed theology from the past that should have been scrapped a long time ago. All boiling down to a corruption in man's nature because of the lack of defining the simple terms of the nature of man and the nature of sin and how it relates to repentance and faith proven by deeds. That's the key here. That's the key. There has to be a departure from iniquity, and it has to be done in repentance. And man has to be able to produce those deeds because his nature is free, exclusively independently free, as we've talked about in our last couple of lessons, to come to God in repentance and godly sorrow. Surely the Spirit is convicting the world of sin, righteousness, judgment all day long, assisting people through that time and that season to come clean with God. I fear so many of you want to see conversion so bad that you think, well, just if we can get them to admit to this or admit to that and then repeat some words or receive Jesus as their personal Savior, well, then, then we'll get them into the faith. No, we won't. No, we'll put them on the path of error unless they come clean with God entirely in that process. So take the time and the effort required to bring them through that season of godly sorrow so they can find redemption in Christ and be truly become a saint of God and find the washing, the regeneration, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit.